On this week's episode of Amari Purple Talk, should Under the Cherry Moon be colorized? Prince is on the Sirius XM tip, the Purple Spotlight, Bite the Boots, and more. Amari Purple Talk starts now. Welcome to episode 37 of Amari Purple Talk, a Prince podcast where I share my thoughts on the Prince musical singularity. I'm Richard Cole, your imagination funk soloist, and let's get started. We've got Prince on Sirius XM, and he's on channel 30 on Sirius XM, and it's about time, although it's only going to be for limited time. Uh, It's going to run, it started Friday, May 1st, and it's going to run all the way until the end of the month. But I think the timing is right. You know, a lot of us are still sort of sheltered in place and or our activities are limited, uh, even though things in a lot of places are slowly beginning to reopen. Um, But as far as as far as Prince fans, a good cure for the sort of uh, sheltered-in blues, Uh, this was a pleasant surprise. Uh, One of the highlights from Friday uh, is an unreleased demo of a planned radio show that was intended for the Sirius XM format. Uh, I'm not sure the reasons why it didn't go forward, um, but you know, this in lieu of, say, having an unreleased song or an unreleased album drop. Um, this is pretty good. This is a pretty good idea. Um, I've got a chance to listen to quite a bit of it. Um, especially I tried to listen in Friday uh, as much as I could. Of course, the timing, you know, I'm doing my <laughs> very essential, unessential essential work there. Uh, But however, uh, I did get a chance to kind of catch up, say within the last uh, 48 hours or so. And I really love this format. And I really would like to see this whole thing grow into an ongoing uh, program. Uh, So like I said, we only have it until May 31st. But you know, let's enjoy this while we can. Now, basically a lot of, you know, Prince listeners have access to Sirius XM, uh, myself included. Um, but for a lot of newbies out there, this is the perfect chance. If you have a lot of you that listen to Amari Purple Talk, if you have Sirius XM and you want to do like a deep dive, so I'm not sure what your gateway album or song is, this is definitely a way to kind of get the full on experience. And it is a phenomenal, uh, can't talk, phenomenal decision by the estate, by Sirius XM, by including, I mean, there are tons and tons of surprises in this, not necessarily surprises, but it covers a you know his entire career. Uh, what I love about it, you get something from the '80s, and then you'll get something that's more recent. You know, um, I know there was one point I've heard Black Muse. I've heard, you know, I think uh, maybe Big City. I know definitely Black Muse. I've heard um, quite a few tracks from Artificial Age. Um, then it goes into almost NPG Music Club deep dive territory. Uh, earlier today, I uh, got a chance to hear the, you know, um, question of you slash the one slash fallen medley uh, from the musicology tour. Remember, that was accessible as a download on the NPG Music Club. That was amazing to hear. Um, Haven't listened to that in a long time. So and then you also get um, the protege acts and you also get 
in some cases, some of the originals. Uh, I've heard um, The Glamorous Life, uh, Prince's version from originals, the original recording of it. Uh, let's see what else. You also get covers. Um, I had no idea that Mariah Carey did a cover of The Beautiful Ones. It wasn't bad. It was different. It's different, given the context of what The Beautiful Ones as a song, you know, in its place in the movie and on the soundtrack, you know, you would think that that's, and I've heard, um, I think I've heard Usher cover it once as well, but, you know, Mariah Cares was the biggest surprise for me, uh, hearing that on the station as well. So it covers a very, very wide range, you know, throughout his entire career. And like I said, I hope it's something that they keep going. Um, now, as far as the demo for the plan program, I enjoyed that. From the, I really didn't get a chance to sit from beginning to end, uh, but I got to hear uh, a large portion of it. And I get, yeah, I love it. I mean, uh, Cat Williams' involvement, you know, with him being Ezekiel, <laughs> I dig that quite a bit. Um, you know, that whole thing, uh, especially leading up to Black Sweat. And then after that, hearing uh, Mother's Finest uh, doing Baby I Love You, that song. F Deluxe does a pretty decent cover of that. Or if you get their CD, AM Static, check that out. It, they do a pretty faithful cover version. But hands down to the original by Mother's Finest. You know, that's a very underrated group. Uh, definitely a group, again, one of those should be considered for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, because they predate bands like Fishbone, they predate Living Color, as far as, you know, here's a black band, they're funky, but very heavily leaning on rock, and, you know, the demo covers, unreleased tracks at the time, uh, definitely a commercial for 3121. And also, too, you know, these are other songs or other different styles of music that Prince is into, you know, and turning us on to that, you know, or like, wow, I love that song. Wow, I didn't know he loved that song, too. So, I mean, that for me, that little sequence of Black Sweat, then it goes into Mother's Finest. Then they play Sly and the Family Stones in time. I mean, you know, that's my, you know, pretty much how I roll listening to music a lot, too. Um, hearing Jimi Hendrix's uh, first rays of the new rising sun. So, I mean, it, again, like I said, for newbies or just fans of music in general, you know, this just wasn't somebody that was just caught up in his own music so much you know he liked other styles of music as well uh, I loved the live version of Beautiful Strange and then that was taken from a performance literally at the 3121 address of the home he was renting in LA that was you know that was amazing to hear I haven't heard that before you know, who knows? Maybe we'll get that in a box set or something one day. Uh, just there's just so much. And like I said, just the, you know, his musical taste, you know, I was just knocked out by that just as much as just hearing the songs, even though we have a lot of them. You know, it's just supporting this format. You know, um, you know, there's so many other artists on the Sirius XM, whether they're hosting their own shows uh you have jimmy jam that has a show on sirius xm sort of like a podcast slash interview show you know this is something i would like to see ongoing and like i said i could just go on on and on about it uh like i said the hearing the dance the 3121 version it's actually made me go back and reevaluate this album, which we'll get into a little bit later. But 
again, I'm just I'm just excited. I'm over the cherry moon with this format. And it's exciting to listen to because especially when it gets um, into the sort of influences part of it, it reminds me it's. Um, I don't know. How can I put it? It's it reminds me a little bit of radio how it used to be in the 70s like i said just kind of and i think that was sort of the goal when prince and dj rashida was putting together this concept of just turning you on to different music or kind of going back to when yes you had a program director but the power was with the djs and that just means that back then it wasn't so much about the hit single, especially late 60s, early 70s, as the album became more than just, you know, one or two hit singles and a bunch of filler where legitimate thought pre thriller, you know, meaning that the thought wasn't to make every single song a hit. The goal was to make every single song meaningful. And. Back then, like I said, you had the singles or you had artists that really didn't like Led Zeppelin. They're not necessarily known as singles artists. You bought the album. You know, and to quote Prince from uh, the Vibe TV show appearance. No matter where you drop the needle in those days, you knew you were getting some quality out of it. So I think just kind of that feel of 70s radio, you know, before things became corporate, before the corporate takeovers and people that care nothing about your favorite genre, but they make this list telling you these are the songs in your genre you should like, you know, and forcing certain artists and certain crap down your throat, you know, back, you know, late 60s, 70s, radio you know it was the field of research was wide open and whatever the dj was into you know and there's a lot of songs by a lot of people where you know if you take um let's take prince for instance you know housequake and adore were never singles but even though that like i said that we're in the 80s and that sort of transition to full-on corporate takeover was kind of, you know, cementing its foothold in the situation. You know, radio still played those songs. You know, they still played, you know, If I Was Your Girlfriend because of this, it was the single. Or they played You Got the Look because it was the single that was out. But a lot of people got into the Sign of the Times album because they were still playing Housequake. And they were still playing a door on those radio stations. So I think that was the move to kind of get back to that feeling of it was just about good music. You know, not a formula, not a format. It was just funky. It was just soulful. And it just made you feel a certain way. I hope they extend this out. Um, what would be cool if they can extend it through the month of June. You know, that way you can kind of almost compensate for the lack of uh, Prince celebration, actually. You know, or it would have been cool. I mean, it's nice to get it now. Like I said, it was a nice surprise. But it would have been even cooler just to have it start in June. But that being said, hopefully they could extend this out through the month of June. But, um, or if it's a thing of at this stage trying to regroup and plan and to make this an ongoing format, um, if later rather than sooner, then yeah, I would do a big launch in June, you know, say, you know, next June 7th, June 7th, 2021, you know, the launch of an ongoing print show. Now, between this and Questlove's four-day, you know, DJ session 
celebrating Prince. To me, these two, those two things are the best tributes than the Grammy tribute. And like I said, you know, you can check out my YouTube channel on Amara Communications and you can see my re or listen to my review of the Grammy tribute on YouTube. Um, but to me, the Prince Sirius XM channel and Questlove's DJ set from last week, you know, those are better. That was better. It was is it because it centers on Prince and it centers on the most important factor, the music, and it didn't limit it to one particular era. Like I said, I get the network aspect of it with the Grammy tribute, but for me, it's about, you know, music lovers, people that love to discover new things. And if people, regardless of age, if they're not a Prince fan and they get into it because of, again, a certain song or a certain album, then definitely for a fact, I recommend checking out this Sirius XM channel. It's channel 30 on Sirius XM. I'd say check it out. And like I said, the whole field of research is right there. And, you know, I'll envy each and every new person that will experience certain songs for the very first time. So let's just enjoy it. Let's support it. Again, this was a nice surprise. So thank you to the Prince of State. Thanks to Sirius XM for putting this together. It was definitely long overdue. And hopefully you guys can make it an ongoing thing somewhere down the road. I definitely would keep that, you know, program there, you know, or I'd alternate, you know, between a few channels. But I would say. 70 to 90 percent of the time it would stay on that channel you know just for the like i said it, you know they switch it up pretty good so but what's most important is what do you think um if you have sirius xm and if you've had a chance to check it out did do you enjoy the format do you like that it represents his entire career um do you like that it includes the proteges and cover songs um, did you like the concept demo? Uh, I know I enjoyed that a whole lot. Um, I heard about maybe 60% of it, but what I've heard, I enjoyed and would look forward to more of that format as well. So let me know what you guys think. Leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And from there, we are going to talk about should under the cherry moon be colorized or would you like to see a color version of it so every now and then somebody will post a color photo color still from the motion picture under the cherry moon you know or somebody will do like a mock-up of the uh, DVD cover and instead of it being in black and white it's in color now under the cherry moon was originally filmed with color film but it was turned to black and white now from a professional standpoint it's why it looks very like a muddy black and white it doesn't I would say it doesn't really represent the true film or black and white film that's, you know, actually filmed with black and white film. Um, or I'll say it doesn't represent an actual black and white negative print of the film. Uh, kind of gives it that sort of muddy, sort of grayish tone throughout. So it doesn't have like a good film noir aspect of it. Uh, it doesn't have a classic black and white quality to it. 
So when the film was released back in 86, you know, criticize it all you want. It's, I put it this way, from my perspective, if it's not taken as a serious film and if you try to look at it as sort of a, an almost romantic comedy, then a lot of it works. And I will agree with the fact that he should not have died at the end of the movie. Spoiler alert for any newbies that haven't seen it, but just go seek it out for yourself. It, you know, we're not talking about Casablanca by any stretch of the imagination. So by all means, just go check it out for yourself. But spoiler alert, he should have lived at the end and it should have gotten a traditional Hollywood happy ending. You know, I get his aesthetic choices for ending it that way, but it would have made for a better film if it did have the traditional Hollywood ending. You know, get a few, fil- you know, he should have had a few films under his belt, then go for the risky move, but this is Prince we're talking about, so nothing's ever predictable. Anyway, so I see a lot of these posts, you know, and, you know, I've had friends too, you know, that really, you know, that enjoy the film to a certain point. But the main complaint was that it was not in color. Now, granted, just putting it in color won't make it a better film. But if you're into film or filmmaking, then the choice of color versus black and white. Like I said, it won't make it a better film, but it may, you know, maybe reacting to the, some of the color schemes of it in relationship to how you should feel towards certain scenes in the film. There's an argument that could be made on that point. Uh, however, like I said, there's a tremendous amount of the fan base that wants to see this released in color. Now, I did a little research here, and I'm going to start with the fact that this is a Warner Brothers picture. Warner Brother owns the rights to the film, and even after... 2021 they will still own the rights to the parade soundtrack as well so but this being a Warner Brothers film last year or no actually earlier this year there was an announcement that Warner Brothers along with Universal Pictures are doing a joint venture in regards to the manufactured distribution of DVDs and Blu-rays, thereby kind of saving that particular industry because the move overall is to try to get things to be more digital or to purchase things digital and eliminating the physical media altogether. Uh, But Universal and Warner Brothers have come together to do a joint venture in regards to um, manufacturing and distribution of DVDs and Blu-rays. Uh, Warner Brothers has a sort of division. I can't think of the name of it at the moment, um, but it specializes in the release of sort of lesser known slash more fan favorite or cult film enthusiast uh, to which under the cherry moon and graffiti bridge would qualify meaning that you will always be able to get a physical copy of those two films now that being said would they go through the expenditure of doing all the special features Uh, I know the original DVD release of Under the Cherry Moon. It did at least include, in addition to the trailer, 
uh, the music videos from the film. And of course, that's the extent that they were willing to go, unlike the 20th anniversary release of Purple Rain, which gave you several documentaries along with the uh, music videos from the film as well. So for something like Under the Cherry Moon, would they go through that expenditure of creating special features for it and providing either a second disc or at least an option in the DVD menu to view a colorized version of it. So the thing is, is that how many Prince fans would it take to support the release of an Under the Cherry Moon uh, special features DVD along with a bonus color version of the film? Now, these days, we have the advantage of digital colorization which um, costs, we'll give an estimate of about $3,000 per minute for a film. So the average cost for a feature film would amount to around $300,000. So the question would be, would Warner Brothers be willing to spend that amount of money uh, to colorize a film that I don't even think that they were able to break even on, or they barely broke even on it. But that was its original theatrical run. So, of course, it's probably gained a little bit of legs um, after that time, at least running through cable, let's say for the latter half of the 80s. Uh, again, uh, there's also uh, VHS sales after its theatrical run so I don't know maybe they were able to recoup some of the costs at that point uh, however not sure what the average sales were for the initial DVD release but again if you're going to spend around say three hundred thousand dollars for the cost of colorizing a film uh, it doesn't cost that much to manufacture the physical media. Uh, and as far as the distribution channels, you would make a lot more money releasing it as a digital release. In other words, uh, you can release just the colorized version of it, or you can release the original or re-release the original film like with Amazon Prime. You could do a release with bonus material as well. And especially, I don't know about the HBO now, but if they have the same format as Disney Plus, it's almost the same as actually pi uh, buying the uh, Blu-ray as well. Uh, but with that being said, so if it takes about $300,000 to digitally colorize a film... And then factor in your manufacturing costs, distribution costs. The bottom line is that say if only, if we just, even if you just sold it at say, let's just say about $9.99 minimum. Multiply that by about 50,000 people. You've almost doubled your cost so I mean granted I don't know you know um, I wish there was a way I can get a poll of how many actual Prince fans would buy a uh, buy an Under the Cherry Moon DVD or Blu-ray with bonus features that would include a colorized version and I wonder if that would be more than 50000 But this is, for me, I'm making it a conservative estimate. Warner Brothers can make a profit by a re-release of Under the Cherry Moon, whether as a special edition DVD Blu-ray set 
or just a standalone under the cherry moon in color version of it. It will, you know, I mean, not to say it will break any sales records, but it will make money. There is a profit. They just put the investment into it. It can make money. And I would like to see it. Um, you know, various colors, you know, we respond to it in a way, whether it's on a conscious or subconscious level. Uh, we respond to it in certain ways that, who knows, maybe certain things about that would heighten our excitement about the film. Like I said, it's not, you know, it's not Citizen Kane. It's not Do the Right Thing by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but it's an entertaining film. Um, and it's grown legs over time. Uh, I mean, it was originally vilified. But I know people like myself, the more I've watched it over the years, and I would say probably by around late 80s, it holds up very well. Um, like I said, I look at it more as uh, sort of an almost failed romantic comedy then, you know, the it, I know it was kind of put forth as an almost serious film, almost, but uh, or a serious romantic film. Uh, but there are places you laugh that you just can't help laughing in that's supposed to be serious. I know the, you know, Jerome's sort of emotional response to Christopher Tracy's death, you know, just having just been murdered right there in front of him. You know, that probably, you know, it got a lot of laughs. I know when I remember seeing it in the theater, you know, it just got the laughs. You know, I'm sitting there like, you know, this is supposed to be a serious part of the film. And it's like people are just cracking up. It's like, oh, God, don't let Tracy die. You know, <laughs> and people were just cracking up. But it's like, you know, I get it. It wasn't, you know, like I said, it wasn't Oscar worthy performance. And then again, like I said, as a creative choice, I think the Hollywood, you know, the traditional Hollywood, they lived happily ever after would have made this a better film, regardless if it was black and white or in color. Uh, but that's my opinion on it. I don't know. Maybe I'll do a, a Namari T Purple Talk special on Under the Cherry Moon at some point. But um like I said, it, it's an enjoyable film and it's something that I would like to add to the archives. Like I said, if you do some good special editions, I also saw and somebody had an alternate opening of the film that a good chunk of it, I don't know if you edit it, you know, maybe take out a minute or two of it, I guess. Kind of maybe edit it a little bit more that to me it worked in a way, I think maybe it could have benefited from additional takes, maybe to get some of the performances a little bit better. Uh, but as far as an opening, I thought it worked better than the actual opening of the film to me. Um, if you guys can find that online somewhere on YouTube, somebody has it. Um, but definitely check that out. But yeah, I mean, um, the deleted scenes, you know, I would love to see deleted scenes of that. Uh, like I said, put it in color. Maybe, you know, I know we're kind of getting into heavy expenditures at this point and we want this thing to sell. But if there's a way to do cheaply do a documentary uh, about the making of the film, then that's something I would also like to see as well. So, yeah, I would definitely like to see a version of Under the Cherry Moon in color. But what's most important is what do you guys think? Um, are you part of that group that wants to see it in color? Um, are you happy with the Blu-ray or DVD or the original black and white film? Leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And with that, we are going to move on to our Purple Spotlight. And our Purple Spotlight is a segment that highlights a Prince album, film, video, or an associated artist, and today's Purple Spotlight is on 3121. 
All right, so as I was listening to the Prince Sirius XM channel, uh, one of the songs that popped up was The Dance that was on 3121. Uh, it was also on, let's see, let me double check here. We do strive for accuracy on this show. Dun, dun, dun. Yep, got it right here. The uh, it was a version that was originally released on the Chocolate Invasion, which was Volume One of tracks from the NPG Music Club. Man, I miss those days. So, uh, but anyway, um, so there was a sort of a remake of the song that was on Thirty One Twenty One, and which version I like the best it kind of fluctuates you know but um, as I was listening to it on uh, the Sirius XM channel I was like yeah that's a pretty good version of that and yeah that's a pretty good album you know that wasn't a half bad album to me I didn't like it as much as musicology and I, I'll put it this way musicology should have had black sweat and then there are elements of 3121 that could have used some elements of musicology and that's just my particular take but as a complete listening experience for me as an album yeah musicology works a little bit better for me than 3121 but having listened to the dance on Sirius XM I've gone back and reevaluated the album itself. And, you know, I know a lot of people, you know, were like, this is their favorite album, and a lot of people like it better than Musicology. And a lot of people feel that this was his best album of the 2000s. Now, granted, my favorite album of the 21st century by Prince is Artificial Age. Um, but again, like I said, reevaluating this album, you guys are practically right. This is a damn good album. <laughs> um, now I remember when I got it initially. I mean, I you know the first four songs on this are flawless. You know, so that's my consistency from the time I bought this in 2006 through now. There is no argument that. 3121, Lolita, Te Amo Carazon, Black Sweat, hands down, you know, are very, very strong. And to me, definitely eclipse a lot of the material that's on the musicology. And Black Sweat, to me, is what I call a modern Prince classic, meaning that everybody measures the bar from the 80s. So there are songs after, say, you know, either 1988, 89, or even 90, that there are certain songs that definitely stand up to any of the legendary classic material. And to me, Black Sweat is definitely one of those. You know, that definitely, I would say, once Sony gets the classic material and if they do either a box set or if they do some type of, you know, they do their own version of Prince Forever, Black Sweat needs to be in that category. It needs to be on that set list somewhere or track list of that album now say it again black sweat definitely needs to be on a track list of any prince greatest hits from this point forward so once sony gets uh, ha their hands on all the masters you know uh -huh, 1999 yeah of course you know um when doves cry of course kiss of course you know Raspberry Beret, of course. Sign of the Times, of course. 
bad dance for me, yeah. But definitely Black Sweat needs to be included on any greatest hits compilation from this point forward. So with that being said, like I said, the first few. Now, initially, when I got the album in 2006, I really dug Incense and Candles a lot. You know, it was contemporary enough. And the auto-tune was there before the auto-tune really started getting out of hand and becoming overdone and too much of a cliche. Uh, not necessarily by Prince per se, but when all of a sudden everybody was doing it. But I, you know, I enjoyed it for then. Then kind of over time, I sort of lost interest in it. Uh, the other song I played a lot of uh, was Love. I really enjoyed that initially um, when I first got the CD. But again, I kind of got bored with it after a while. Then I heard an acoustic version, which I still like the acoustic version better than this. But, like I said, in reevaluating the album, these two songs have sort of re energized my excitement in the listening experience on it. And let's see, of course, Fury was a good song. Um, I don't know, I was kind of warm on that until I saw the performance on Saturday Night Live. And so after that, I kind of enjoyed it a little bit better. So now we're getting into sort of, well, I skipped Satisfied. To me, Satisfied was sort of a rehash of On the Couch. And it's kind of, I don't know, that, you know, I don't know, at least with Satisfied, it kind of felt like that sort of, that sort of Ray Charles sound to me, that sort of Ray Charles kind of R&B, which I like when Ray Charles does it. But when you've had somebody, when you have somebody like Prince that's doing, you know, from Do Me Baby to Adore to Scandalous to Call My Name, you know, then this was sort of like, eh, okay. Uh, but I remember listening to it, I don't know, kind of in the time since April 21st of 2016 to where you know I've kind of lent a better appreciation of it so to speak and so again as I'm listening again now that you know it I don't find myself skipping it at this point um the word was another one I know again between that and beautiful loved and blessed I know it kind of had that sort of kind of Jehovah's Witness overtones that for me as a Prince fan I was really kind of really just tired of by that point um, but the the beat to the word that sort of that rhythm track I really I still enjoy that and beautiful loved and blessed like I said I've had a few people kind of you know they told me like they love that song a lot and so I kind of get it through their ears so as I listen to it I listen kind of through their prism so I have an appreciation of it that's better and then again we get back to the dance like I think I'll just continue like if I'm listening to to it on 3121 then it's my favorite version then if I go back to listen to the chocolate invasion that version will be my favorite version. Then I'll come back to this. And then this will be my favorite version. But a good song is a good song. So regardless, in this case, it's the same person singing it. But sometimes there are those songs that regardless of who's performing it, it's still a good song. And that's the testament of great songwriting. Is that no matter the format, you know, if you recognize it for what it is, you recognize the tune, the melody, and the whole bit, then you know it's good. You know, it's really good at that point. Um, and Get On The Boat is pretty funky. It's, um, to me, in a way, it's sort of like, 
sort of son of everlasting now. But, you know, it's it's not a bad song. And it's a pretty good closer to the album. You know, if you're ending an album on a high note. So it starts off on a party note, ends on a party note, on a positive note. And, yeah, like I said, you out there in the Prince musical singularity, you know, I've read your commentary on this album. And the... Sirius XM, the uh, demo for that, which was largely a commercial for this uh, album. You know, that was pretty effective as well. I don't, you know, in a lot of ways, I know this album did go to number one, but I wonder if there was a way to have gotten a version of that out to further promote this album. I, I think this would have uh, definitely gone a long way to helping sustain the sales of the album going forward. But um, definitely, again, um, for a lot of the newer listeners and people that are just learning about Prince for the first time and, like I said, want to go beyond the classic material, this is a pretty good start, I would say. I would, you know, I would recommend this to a lot of people to, as a, you know, like, or even people that were on board, you know, at least up until Purple Rain or only jumped on with Purple Rain and, you know, decades have gone by and didn't think that he did a lot since. Yeah, I'd put him on to this and say, you know, yeah, he was consistent throughout you know he was still putting out strong material all the way into the 21st century so like i said i've been thoroughly convinced uh so this will rank alongside musicology with me so now i have more than three or more than two favorites from the 21st century of course, not, like I said, there's a lot to be said for the Rainbow Children as well. Like I said, but that's from a more aesthetic standpoint. This is more, you know, you've got hit singles on here or songs that should have been hit singles on it. Um, it stands up to any and everything that was going on in 2006 to me. So definitely, yeah, I recommend this to, like I said, any of the newbies that want to do a deep dive with his uh, catalog here. So definitely check this out. Uh, what's most important is what do you guys think? Is this a favorite album of yours from the 21st century? Is it your favorite Prince album overall? Leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And now we are going to move on to our final segment of the day. And that is going to be what we call here as the Bite the Boot segment. And Bite the Boots is a segment that highlights a circulating bootleg or vault recording or video for consideration for an official release by the estate. And today's Bite the Boots selection is the NPG audio shows now originally i was going to call this the npg audio shows and just release them on sirius xm but i've come up with a better idea and that idea is to why not release them as a box set an entire box set and for help with this segment, uh, I've had to do some research on PrinceVault.com. Um, that is a very good website uh, for information on Prince's entire discography, uh, any videos, films, and gives great details or pretty good details on the history of the sessions, uh, when things were recorded. Uh, if certain songs were intended for other projects, uh, gives as much information as they could find on unreleased projects, 
Uh, I've utilized them for quite a few of the Bite the Boot segments uh, for this show. Uh, but the audio shows were downloads uh, on MP3 as part of being a member of the NPG Music Club. And like I said, that period to me was like of all the websites he had done, at least from the standpoint of accessing original unreleased material or unreleased material. That was the best site. Uh, Love for one another. That website was cool. Um, Because I don't know if that was just all him typing that stuff in or if he paid people to type stuff in. But from I know some of the I guess you call them blogs now, but a lot of those was some heavy information. Uh, But at least some of the commentary or the daily updates, I don't know if that was actually him doing that or if it was him and then maybe one or two other people. But as far as things that offered the audio shows, yeah, definitely MPG Music Club during that period was the best. And I missed out on a lot of this. I didn't come on board until 2004. Um, But the audio shows... Uh, The first one was released on February 18th of 2001. And basically, it again, they were sort of kind of like the demo, like the demo for the uh, Sirius XM program. So I think this was something that he had an idea and maybe why we haven't seen anything during his lifetime was that he was basically testing the waters with these audio shows because it was pretty much the same thing except the mission statement of the audio shows was that this was a program that was basically artist controlled and not only was he providing a platform for you know his freedom from record labels But he was also advocating, you know, say in the case of the first episode, there was Rhonda Smith. She had just dropped her first CD, you know, which was independently done. Annie DeFranco, who was somebody that he, I wouldn't say looked up to, but kind of held as an example of what he wanted to do with his own freedom from record companies, because she was selling, you know, CDs out pretty much out the trunk of her car, you know, never had any record label, major label support. She started her own label. And, you know, she owns her own masters and, you know, she was in control of everything. So this was sort of giving a platform to artistic freedom uh, through the NPG Music Club and sort of preaching the me- the message to the members of the club. And, you know, again, it had, like I said, not only his songs, uh, but like I said, other artists, not only just in his camp, um, but that he respected as well and supporting them. And there was also, just like the Sirius XM uh, demo, uh, good, you know, co- comedic segues, um, you know, Prince doing funny voices and, you know, some of the NPG, like Rhonda Smith, Morris Hayes, you know, just kind of doing these little funny bits in between the songs. And like I said, originally I thought, why not just play those on the uh, Sirius XM? Now, if they have, then, of course, obviously I missed it. And if I did miss it, you know, you guys out there, just let me know in the comments. And then I'll definitely, because I know they'll rerun a lot of that stuff, you know, during the month. So I'll catch it or I'll catch one of them or I'll try to catch a few minutes of one. And that's cool. But like I said, I switched it to the idea of, why not just do a box set? 
because it's you know you couldn't really include it as a bonus disc because uh, there's so many uh I think are there nine I think there are nine of these all together and as I am looking that information up yeah I think there might have been like at least nine of these as I'm thinking but yeah it would be difficult because given the time frame of release so we're looking at you know around 2001 for a lot of it so you know if you try to include it make it like a rainbow you, well it wouldn't fit the concept either if you did it as a uh, rainbow children box set or something or deluxe edition it, it wouldn't necessarily work so to speak so let's see we got nine Oh, looks like we got 10. Okay, 11. So there were 11 of these programs. And, of course, a lot of the different songs uh, did end up on, say, The Chocolate Invasion, Slaughterhouse. Uh, but the beauty of it is it also included a lot of you know, vault materials like uh, live performances, rehearsals of certain songs. Uh, let's see. So I'm looking at like the last one here. Uh, there's a different remix of Hot With You that's on there. Uh, just like the first audio show. There was a mix of Love Sign that I've never heard before. I'm familiar with Shock G's remix of it that's on Crystal Ball. Uh, but there was a mix of it that I thought was just as good. I mean, I like the original version of the song. I like Shock G's mix a lot because uh, it just has that digital underground vibe to it. And especially that sort of um, that near... You know, Tupac's I Get Around sound that, you know, Shock G put on that. So, yeah, I mean, there's that. But, yeah, that is a version on this audio show that's that's really good that I enjoy, too. So, I mean, granted, a lot of these songs based on the project, you know, will end up as part of that project's um, super deluxe edition and I know that Sony will get around to it. But I'd say you could still release these audio shows in its entirety as a box set. And it's just a nice little chunk of Prince history. Um, it would be worth it just for the flow of the songs, the segues in between. You know, and of course, you know, we're Prince fans. You know, we're still going to have the some of these songs, whether they release a chocolate invasion as a standalone reissue you know we're still going to go get that but just to have because again like i said the selling point uh there's like i'm still looking at uh episode 11 of this you have the question of you which is a rehearsal uh, there's Groove On and The Undertaker, along with Whole lot of Shaking going on. You know, so, I mean, there, you know, so there's those curiosities as well. But, like I said, you know, be the same songs, different format. You know, and sometimes, too, you know, you may not be in the mood to say break out chocolate invasion or you may not be in the mood to break out whatever album but like i said just to kind of put this on and listen to this particular playlist of songs along with the sort of you know comedic interludes that go along with them i mean i'm sure you can find them online somewhere maybe on youtube somebody will have it posted or at least one of them anyway um, but again, like I said, having it as a box set, 
again having the estate release it officially this is probably the closest or among the closest thing to because i the bite the boot segment for new listeners the idea of that came out of frank zappa's uh beat the boots which you know um him and other artists were just as heavily bootlegged as prince but frank zappa's answer to the bootleggers was okay well i'm gonna copy your album artwork i'm gonna take your little playlist or you know oh you may you know you're selling my live performance from this city from 1978 or whatever well okay well since i've got the master tape to that then i'm going to put that out myself and then i think some cases too if if it was something that he didn't have the master tape to then basically he just take that ver in release it you know <laughs> officially that way you know and like i said it's going to him the money's going into his own pocket and the fans are getting it at you know a cost effective options with that so this something like this is probably closest to that in concept um you know, let's see i'm looking at one Yeah, quite a few of these songs have been officially released. Uh, let's see. This is episode 10. And let's see. With this one, uh, probably the only selling points of episode 10 would be like a... It's an alternate mix of Face Down and then My Medallion. Which again, could possibly end up on a Chocolate Invasion reissue but like i said this would be just one disc out of 11 and again like i said just in addition to the playlists uh, like i said there are a lot of bonus bonus things a lot of rehearsals uh some stuff taken from some live concerts and the comedic set segues I think it can work um, like I said as a box set it's something that I would enjoy uh, and again like I said I'm a liner note junkie so you know throw in a big book you know a good thick book of liner notes uh, detailing the history of the audio shows and you know some of the people that were there you know interview Morris Hayes or other members of the MPG and get their thoughts on, you know, what their favorite thing about being a part of that. And, yeah, you know, I don't know. I think this would work. Like I said, it's a nice little slice of Prince history and it really illustrates his humor. Um, like I said, it's more of that concept. Uh, which was further developed. Uh, let's see. Oh, actually, I'm getting I'm getting the timing wrong, aren't I? Um, this was sort of the prototype of the demo. So I think this was something that was always on his mind to do. You know, I think that you had the audio shows, then the idea to try to approach Sirius XM to do a show with that same type of format. You know, I wish that, you know, he was still around. I think that now he would be more receptive to do it. I bet you now, you know, we'd probably get a, a, a whole lot of stuff. Um, you know, kind of like the Rolling Stones, uh, their new song, Living in a Ghost Town. You know, they dragged that one out of the vault and reworked it to kind of fit the current climate of what's going on and it's turned into a big hit for them so i think he would be doing stuff like that and at the same time doing something like this with the audio shows too to keep us entertained 
while we're all, you know, we're sheltering in place or, you know, like I said, for people that are doing to me legitimate essential functions and for lo folks like me that are considered essential and still dealing with the public, so to speak. But, um, you know, just coping with the stress of it all. Yeah, you know, that I think that he would be doing something like this and, you know, making our days a little bit brighter and helping us get through things a little bit better. But, um, yeah, I would definitely like to see this more so as a box set. But like I said, if they've already aired these things for Sirius XM, by all means, let me know. And I'll definitely keep a closer ear to it. But hopefully... I'll tune in and be surprised if I do hear some. So uh, what's most important? What do you think? Um, I'm sure a lot of you have downloaded these shows when they uh, first dropped back in 2001. Um, let me know your thoughts. Would you like to see official? Um, of course, they won't be MP3s. They'll be remix or mastered for the proper CD formats. So uh, let me know what you think. Do you think that you would like a box set of these shows commemorating this little slice of purple history? Uh, leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And that is going to end this week's episode, episode 37. And we will return next week with more purple goodies. And course stay healthy take care of yourselves let's take care of each other we were doing pretty good and then all of a sudden folks started going crazy i don't know if it's stir crazy then too there's folks that just don't care stay on guard for those folks um again vitamin up drink your water folks uh research your fruits and vegetables keep that immune system boosted um remember we're not talking cures but you know keep your immune system boosted because it can you know either help keep you from getting it or if you do then you got you know you got better weapons to fight with so let's just do that take care of yourselves take care of each other Let's definitely, from this point forward, make this world a little bit better than how we found it. And of course, and as always, keep it purple and on the one. This is not the last call. Yeah.